All right, so um, I'll kind of take the lead here. We're going to talk about how to use census data in your reporting. Just real quick, who has done this kind of stuff in the past? Who's used census data before? So most, okay. most of you guys? All right, cool. Well, um, hopefully there's not too much uh, that you guys already know. Um, if we you know, get to stuff and you guys want to ask questions, you know, I don't have like a sense of like real rigor on getting through this thing, so let's have a discussion. If you guys want to talk more, we can talk more about whatever. And if you guys have any questions, just jump in in the middle. Like we'd like it to be a discussion. If you see something that you have a question on, just jump right in, please. Yeah. All right. Uh, so what is the census? Um, have you guys seen Anchorman 2? <laughs> All right. This is a short clip from Anchorman 2 uh, that I thought was really funny. I want to play for you guys real quick. Well, after eight years, <laughs> after the end, <laughs> pays our bills. All right. <laughs> So that was like, I was watching Anchorman 2 over the holidays and just like saw that and I was like, I have to, I have to show that to these guys. Okay. So what is the census really? Okay. So it's a count of the population, right? You do it every 10 years. Um, it was written into the U.S. Constitution. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the census just because I think it's really important. I think it also helps kind of give context to what's in there and how it works and things like that. So um, something that I find really interesting is that the idea of a census was one of the most kind of progressive elements uh, that was incorporated in the American democratic experiment um, 200 and whatever years ago, 40 years ago. Um, you know, they, it was... It was a way to facilitate um, giving proportional representation in um, the lower chamber of, of Congress. And I just find that really cool. So I wanted to point that out. Um, so the first time they did it was 1790. Um, done it 22 times since. When they counted, the first time they counted 3.9 million people and there was a lot of skepticism that that number was accurate. There, was, there were people who thought that the number should have been higher. Um, and, you know, they've gotten better at it and incorporated a lot more into it as time has gone on. Um, and since the passage of the uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, it's also been used to make sure that we have conformity to one person, one vote. Um, so kind of further... Um, furthering proportional representation. Uh, okay, so this is the 1910 census over here uh, to give you guys a sense of kind of what this has looked like over the years. Um, and this should give a sense once we look at some of these other ones of kind of what's been added over time. You know, in, in 1910 they had things like Name, age and sex, whether they were married or single, birthplace, uh, <coughs> father's birthplace, mother's birthplace, occupation. Um, so let's take a look at the 2000 long form. I'll be jumping in and out of the uh, presentation, and I think we'll make this presentation available for you guys afterwards, too. And so there's links in there so you guys can take a look at this stuff. Uh, from the presentation itself. So um, quite a bit more, you can see, a lot more organized than in 1910, easier to read. Um, you know, they added a lot more about uh, race and ethnicity, um, educational attainment, uh, all sorts of stuff. You guys hopefully have gotten this stuff in the mail um, 
and seen some of these in, at some point. At least that's the idea. Um, so there's a long, a long form and a short form version of the census. Um, I believe that they are moving away from that, uh, from two different versions of the, of the actual census. Um, but they have done it two different ways, at least in 2000. This is the 2010 census. I believe, yeah, this is the one where they just started doing one version. But, um, you know, it's kind of cool to take a look at this, um, explore what that looks like when you guys have some more time. Yeah? Are there any questions the census is legally prevented from asking? Hmm. Like sexual preference, for example? I don't think that they would be prevented from asking. So they, they can truly ask anything if they want. I think so. Yeah. Um, I think that there was, okay, so we're about to talk about the American Community Survey, which is um, a variation on the census, and it's done more frequently, and it's a survey, right? So it's a, it goes out to a smaller number of people every time. And that one, I, th I think what I remember hearing recently is that they had figured out a way to ask about cohabitation uh, with and, and whether it was same sex. Uh, so I think that they're getting to asking those kinds of questions. Now, there are, um, they are prevented legally from disclosing, you know, the most granular information about people. I mean, you can't search by somebody's name and find out what their educational attainment is. Um, so the Census Bureau definitely does take all their information, put it together, compile it, and then make it available in a way that um, provides anonymity to everybody who's taken it. Um, so this is the American <laughs> Community Survey. And um, this one goes out every year. And it's got some different kinds of questions in it. Um, let's see here. So, OK, so person, two, yeah, person, I think this might get actually answer your question. So person two, person one, they're going to have sex and sex. And then so if you have male and male and husband or wife, so I think that, that they, they're now getting to this, to this version of the American Community Survey where they actually can make that determination. Do you know how long the anonymity is guaranteed? Uh, there is a number, and I believe it's 70 years. I, maybe, or, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, I think there's a 70-year <coughs> limit on, on that. I just didn't remember what it was. And then what's the sample size on that? So how many of these go out every year? Um, I believe they try to hit one out of every, is it 10 or 20? It's Households. At least, ten. it's at least 10. I know that. Yeah, one out of every 10. And then what they do is they take that and they create. <clears throat> so if then if you go look at the American Community Survey data, uh, what you've got are um, one year, three year, and five year averages. So your one year is going to be, kind of, it's going to have the greatest margin of error, uh, but it's going to be the most current. So like right now, I think you can get the one year for 2013 at the least, and they're starting to release the 2014 stuff. Um, and then, you know, if you want the five year, which is going to be more accurate, smaller uh, margin of error, I think the most recent one on that is going to be like 2011 or 2012. All right. Um, okay, so what's in the census now when you go to actually like kind of take a look at what they've put together? This link right here will take you to a topics page. This is a snapshot of what that topics page looks like. Uh, I'll just go ahead and click on it. We can scroll through and you guys can take a look. Um, and yeah, like I said, the links are nice because if you guys you know, take the slideshow and want to play around with this later, you should be able to jump into these pages and you can explore this stuff on your own. But you can see these are all linked so you can go deeper. Um, you know, if you're interested in uh, topics that are business topics, you can click in here and you can just start exploring what's in the census. Um, Okay. All right, so um, something that's important to talk about is census geography. So, um, you know, they send these things out, people fill them out and send them back. 
Um, and then the way that the data is compiled is by the census's geographies. And they have a bunch of different geographies. And they kind of fit together, um, you know, like smaller pieces into larger pieces. And so you can look at the most granular, which are going to be your census blocks. Uh, census blocks are, <clears throat> I believe, somewhere between 400 and 1,000 people. So that's the smallest unit that you can look at. Um, and then you've got those that fit into block groups, and then those that fit into tracks. And then from there, things get a little bit uh, more varied. Uh, they start to you know, compile tracks into things that are called places. And a place is typically a municipality. Um, and then, then you've got counties, the places sometimes cross counties. So then you start to have different ways of looking at these things, and they don't necessarily all fit into um, the larger piece, but you can, you can attack them <coughs> in whichever way it suits you. Uh, this is an example here. Uh, you can see here that these are census blocks. We uh, are skipping the layer of, that is census block groups, because a block group might be something like this corner over here. Uh, and then there might be you know, something like 10 block groups that make up this census tract. Um, but it's important to just kind of have a, a good understanding of the fact that that exists. And, and How yeah. Do How do they decide? I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't actually know the answer to that. But it is a certain amount of people. They do keep it within a limit. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, the job of doing that usually falls to the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Council of Governments, and they use their knowledge of the local area to cluster population uh, groups. But track, uh, local governments will use track boundaries to try and align with congressional and state legislative districts as well to make it easier for them. <coughs> Right, exactly. Like, um, yeah, exactly. Tracks, for sure, are they try to make sure that tracks don't get um, broken up when they go to redraw legislative districts or congressional districts every 10 years, which is part of that whole reapportionment and proportional representation concept. Um, but it still happens. It still does happen sometimes. Yeah. And, and when that does happen, it creates kind of a unique challenge if you want to do some type of demographic analysis along those new boundaries if they split a boundary and that's something that we've run into on a number of occasions and finally I think we got it figured out um, but that that's a little more kind of advanced level um, calculations and queries that you need to run through your data set to split a geography you basically kind of portion it out to if you have a block and, and a quarter of that block is is cut with the census tract then you kind of apportion you, it's it's a less precise way of doing it, but but it's the the next best thing that you can do. Yeah, if you guys want to write down kind of what they call this, it's disaggregation reaggregation, and yeah, it's how you basically take a geography, chop it up, find out what the proportion at least is for the population, and then apply that proportion to other demographic information that you have that you're looking at for that larger geography. Does that make sense? Okay. Good question. Yeah. Um, like I work in Boston, so would the city of Boston, which is part of a bigger county, would that be its own block group, or would it be a track? Or? So the city of Boston is probably a place, mm -hmm. um, and we can. You're, you're getting ahead of me, okay, <laughs> but can we can we come back to this? All right, cool. Because uh, we, we can we can actually take a look specifically at Boston. Do you want to talk about? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, have any of you used USA Trade online at all in your census dealings a little bit? Okay, uh, so in October of last year, they opened this up for free uh, for anyone to use. Um, and to do that, you need to go on and sign on. Um, but it allows some kind of nice options for you to pull commodity-based data on trade, imports, ex exports, etc. Um, and I'll show you um, where that is. On. So there's, there's a foreign trade section, which you can usually get to and explore data, but most of that is in kind of an aggregate way. Um, and with the USA Trade Online, uh, am I signed in? I'm signed in somewhere up here. I think it's probably the last tab. Oh, what the hell did I do? You broke it. 
I broke it. Um, there we go. Cool. Um, so once you sign in, um, you can get to the screen here. And it shows the different levels of data that you can find at a state level or regional level, um, both imports and exports uh, globally. And the cool thing about this system is that you can drill in pretty detail. Do you guys know like an NAICS code? You can search by commodity, commodity type, type of import, type of export. Um, it's collected by month um, over a period of time. And the current data, I think, only goes back to 2011 um, in this. And we'll, we'll dive into this in a second. Um, but I, I've just started kind of exploring it. I haven't dove too deep into this yet because it's the, the access is new. And I was trying to look at some imports into to Arizona, uh, particularly through the Nogales port of entry, which is a main land port of entry for Arizona. Um, but you can do this basically anywhere. And especially those of you that live in a larger port area, you can get some really specific detailed data on what's coming in and what's going out, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Do you know if that just covers like hard goods or does it cover services as well? I don't think it covers services. I'd have to go through and look through the codes. I've mostly looked at commodity-based. Um, like, uh, you know, there is a difference between for consumption. Um, so this is, so it's quantity, um, where am I looking here? Physical movement of goods. I don't know if services are included, but it does not track state-to-state -state movement of, of goods. Um, so in, in what, what the, this stuff that we're looking at here includes quantity, value, commodity, trading partner country, district or port, the state, method of transportation, uh, special trade programs, duty, dutiable value, and calculated duties. Um, in the foreign trade area, you can actually define it. Like say I was interested in, okay, what's coming in through Arizona and how big of an impact has NAFTA had on trade between, you know, Arizona and you know Mexico, et cetera. Um, you can actually drill down into defining only NAFTA, um, you know, open goods basically, which is pretty cool. Um, so imports and exports. So it's top twenty-five commodities for each state, uh, classified by the Schedule B code. I won't get into that. You guys can click on that and check it out if you want. Um, top twenty-five trading partner countries, um, annual data. So it's twenty ten through twenty fourteen. Um, and then you can do it by the NAICS if you want. And there's other classifications that you can look up as well. Sorry, what does that stand for, the NAICS? It's, a, it's like a standardized code, uh, commodity code base. So it's like a, a multiple digit code. And, and I'll show you what, what those are. Um, and, I, and I don't remember, I, there's more than, there, there's a lot of them. Um, but so, you know, for agriculture, for example, like uh, peanuts and something else would be a very specific, I think it's a six or eight digit code that would define that, that commodity type. It's, it's kind of like um, the federal government's most standardized version of defining and classifying industries. So if, you're ever, like, if you ever find yourself asking like, like how do I exactly define this industry? Or, or if I were gonna break up the entire economy into you know, an exhaustive set of industries, NAICS is the way that it's normally done. Right. Does the data go below state level? Um, counties or anything like that? It can, yes, yes, yes. And that's one of the nice things. I mean, it can even go to, like, if you have a specific port, it can go to that exact port. Um, you can do a regional, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty detailed. And um, I mean, you could spend a lot of time kind of drilling down and seeing how far you can go. And it, it really, you know, when looking at this kind of stuff, is I usually start with, okay, what, what story are we working on? And if I want to look at, like, I did a story on uh, food imports uh, into the U.S., and I was looking at cantaloupe. Uh, specifically, and specifically from Guatemala. And you can really, and now I, I ended up using FDA data and USDA data on import refusal records, which is a whole different set of data. Um, but you can, you can really drill down. And if you have a premise or you have a question, I, I want to answer this question. I want to know what is trade doing for cantaloupes over the last four years? I can say, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Um, if I see a big decrease in one year, then I can say, okay, what happened that year? Was there an import alert? Um, was there an outbreak of some sort, which there was when I, when I was looking, it was back in 2011. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's dive in and, and I'll show you real quick. This is, once I jump into that, that screen where you have those lists, this is the kind of interface that you work with on, on how you can interact with this data and how you can explore it. Uh, and it's really cool. You can, so these are all the commodity types. They're numbered here. Um, and each of these will even drill down further depending on what you choose over here. Um, 
and you can do a sort by ascending, sort by descending. So just even like kind of interviewing the data as you're going through it is a really valuable way to take a kind of a quick snapshot of, of what you're looking into to decide what you actually want to download. Because you can download this in Excel and a CSV in any number of forms. And you can actually graph this out too. Um, but let's jump in and I'll, I'll show you uh, a couple of those things. Ah, damn it. Did it again. Okay, so if I want to look at um, state import data uh, by state of destination, and this would be the NAICS code. So I would click on that, and this is once I've already signed into the system. Um, and you, you do have to sign up for it, and you get a, it takes like maybe a day or so once you sign up, you submit your email, they send you a generated password, yada, yada. Um, so this is the basic interface. You can see on the left, yeah, your left, um, you have state, commodity, country, time. So I'm going to click on Arizona here because I'm interested in seeing Arizona. And if I, to, you can click, the, the kind of tricky way is you have to hit report to see your actual query that you're running. Um, so if I click on report, now I have this huge list of every single commodity um, that is imported um, by type from, it's through October 2015 back to 2011. Now these are aggregate numbers. But the cool thing is you can really drill down. If I wanted to drill into agricultural products, I can click on this, and I can get the different types of agricultural products. Um, but so if I want to go a little further than that, I can click over here into commodity, and this brings up, takes me back to that original screen, but allows me to really drill down. And this is where you can start to get really detailed, specific information. So cantaloupes, for example, or, um, and to, to get rid of the check marks, you just hit that little red X. That'll refresh. Um, and I can start drilling down. Now, if I want to look at oil and gas in Arizona, um, so that, that NAICS code is 2111, basically. Yeah? Just not to sound like the anchorman guy, but why is the census tracking trading of commodities? It doesn't seem like their mission. <laughs> well, um, hopefully for us. No, that's not for us. Um, they do it for trade, for business, for analysis. Um, I mean, I don't know the, their exact mandate of why they're tracking foreign trade, um, but a lot of businesses will use this stuff to see, you know, you can, you can run pretty um, robust reports on, you can see a lot of what's happening in the economy, frankly, by, by looking at this stuff. But I, th I, I can see the value of it. I'm just wondering why I, the census. I think the answer is mission creep, right? I think that right. Um, the federal government had, you know, kind of silos of, you know, you know, the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis, right, is over here doing its thing, and the Census Bureau is over here doing its thing, and then at some point somebody was like, hey, why don't we try to see if we can get some more useful information by sharing data? So now you've got the Census, which is used to dealing with these enormous, complex data sets. They've got the, you know, the kind of the firepower, and so they can work with other agencies that track things that maybe aren't necessarily part of the census, but the Census Bureau ends up <coughs> being the, the place where you go for it. Right. The, the, the tough thing about this interface here is it'll take a little bit of time to get used to figuring out what to click, how to get there. Um, but, but it is effective and it is pretty detailed and there's step by step that you can take to get to that really narrowly defined data set of an import or an export uh, of some type of commodity that, that you might be reporting on or that you're looking for a, a trend. Yeah. yeah, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe you said this. Is it, for like agricultural products, is it based on origin or where it left the country? Um, like I'm pretty sure you can look at both of those. There's, there's an origin filter uh, and I think there's a, there's a destination of, of where, it, where it came into the country. But once it comes into the country, though, if it's shipped further, I think that's in a, in the, a different foreign trade section, if that makes sense. So like if something is... More like exports, like corn, for me, corn grown in Iowa. Uh-huh. You know, right. It's not going to leave the country from Iowa. Right, right. You don't think. You, don't, you never know. Flying it out. Right, think. right. Um, but so let me, I'll, I'll click on what, let's do, um, I'm sure there's some apparel and accessories in here. Um, let's look at knit apparel um, imported, and we'll show that report. And I'll show you a couple other kind of nice little basic tools that you can use. So this is the, the aggregate amount from 11 to 15. If I want to view this in a different way instead of just staring at the data, what I can do is I can chart this out. Um, and this is just a way for you to better visualize the data that you're looking at instead of just looking at the raw numbers. Um, and I could have filtered this to sort it, to do ascending or descending, 
um, over that period of, of basically four years that I'm looking at. What unit is it? What unit? Yeah, what it? Of, of, it is in, is it you, customs, this is the, so it tells you, right, up here, this is customs value of uh, SUS, I don't know what that is. You, it's usually just US dollars. Okay. Um, and it's not like you don't have to multiply it by a thousand or it's, it's the, Actually, it's right, right, it's the actual amount, um, which is kind of nice. Um, you know, and this is, this can be really useful. I mean, if you want to try and save time, yes, it'll take you a couple minutes to drill down, but if you want a quick snapshot, you want to see how a commodity is doing over a, a couple year period, you can just hit this graph and look at this. And you can actually download this and, and use it and maybe pull it into Illustrator and build a static graphic if you want, um, which is kind of nice. Um, you can also do different types of charts. Um, you can do chart display and you can do a 3D bar if you want, or, you know, a, a pie chart or, um, there's, there's lots of different options. And that can help you to visualize um, what the data is actually saying. Any questions on that so far? Make sense? You guys thrilled about this data? <laughs> um, so there's another, a couple other filters. If I want to, so that was, um, if I'm particularly interested in one country importing goods into my state or into the US, you can do it by all these countries. Um, and there's little info boxes. Sometimes it'll, it'll give you a detailed explanation of what, what certain areas are. Um, and there is a definition. There's a way to define clearly, and it, it might be once you drill down farther. Um, I want to go to fish. Report. There is a way to define things further. Um, okay, so you can click on a detailed definition. Uh, if you're not sure exactly what you're saying, this will um, show you kind of a simple breakdown of what exactly you're looking at within your data set. Um, it's, it's basically your record layout. If you, get, if you get a data set from any agency and you say, I don't know what the hell this means. Well, you can get the record layout to know exactly what it means. And, and those of you that have de dealt with census data, that can be really confusing when you have a P9006749 and, and you know, it can be confusing. Um, but so you've ran your report, um, and you can switch easily back to the table and chart up here. You just uh, click over here. Now, if I want to download this, all I need to do is then click this little button here, and I can choose whether I want it as an XML for Excel or a CSV. And there's different types. You can do comma separated values, or you can do um, uh, semicolon delimited. Everybody know kind of, yeah. Um, it depends on what kind of software you're using and how big of a data set, I would say. Um, you know, a CSV can handle a lot more than if you just export an Excel file. Um, if you're dealing with something that has more than like a million rows, for example, uh, you're not going to want to bring that into Excel. Um, you'd want to use something else like SQL or um, SPSS or one of the other kind of higher end programs. Does that make sense? Um, and sometimes, so the, the ASCII is a, is a formatting. It's a, it's a type of formatting for the data itself. Um, and that's just more of a universal kind of language, if you will, to, to read and identify data, how it's classified. Like a date is classified as a date, and text is a you know, general and a number, et cetera. Is there a, it sounds to me like the, the trade-off's going to be stuff I'll do and stuff I'm going to try and get my ID guys. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the that. The trade-off's going to be stuff I might do uh -huh. and stuff I'm going to ask my IT guys to get. Like a million seems like a really high bar for Right. And you're probably, <laughs> you know, you're probably not going to have something that's a million rows um, with, with your imports um, unless you do every commodity into your state over a four period of time. Then it might get up there. But, um, you know, I would use this to start to kind of figure out what, what focus do you want. Because um, if you're looking at every commodity, that's, that's a pretty complex story that's going to take you a really long time to kind of to cycle through. Uh, but yeah, definitely. And are you, do, you, do you guys all use like Excel fairly regularly? Yes, no? Excel, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd say we use Excel for like 90% of what we do. Um, and, and then beyond that, you, you get into a little more higher end programs. And that's more if you're dealing with really complex queries or um, relational databases where you're trying to pull information from multiple databases. Um, but you know, Excel is a really powerful tool. And any CSV you can usually pull into Excel. One thing I'd suggest is practice with this before you need it. Yes. Because I, it is really sludgy 
and you'll have a lot of trial and error before you start getting your. Uh, I, it I might be. I use this every week. Uh -huh. It took me a month before <laughs> I finally could really figure it out. Yeah, yeah. It it and it's it, it can be tricky. And, and that's a really good point. Like, I, I play around with it, and I'm just, you know, you could spend a couple hours just tooling around and seeing what you can do. Uh, but I think that's, that's a great point. Yeah, practice around, like, pick a commodity that might be in your area or with a business that you're looking into. Yeah. I was just going to ask, what are some examples of stories that you've used to stat on? Um, I tr they actually have monthly data on um, state and metro imports. Mm -hmm. And so I do a tracking on, on what. Um, uh, or exports. I do a tracking on what we're exporting and how we're comparing to previous years. And um, but I don't do it for everything that we export. I break it down to our primary focuses, uh, which are advanced industries. And so I use combinations of the NAICS code to, um, to to do that. Wikipedia actually has the NAICS codes, and yeah. I downloaded that, made a PDF, and downloaded that so I can find what I'm looking for. Uh, but yeah, I do it for, for stories on exporting. I do it uh, to, to track how our economy is doing in, in Arizona and um, uh, things along that line. And it's also great for uh, blowing off politicians on certain things. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you guys had any recommendations. I, I am a big fan of online tutorials. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll get into some of those and some other tools like uh, Census Reporter and, um, and Evan will kind of jump into those. Um, there's actually, there was a, a training that Cronkite did a couple years ago on Census and they brought in people from the Census and there's a whole, I'll, I'll um, there's actually, we've got, I think the Reynolds Center might, or maybe it's through Cronkite, we've got some links to some webinars and I know that in the later presentation this afternoon that I'm working on with uh, Steve Doig, we will have a link in that presentation to <coughs> where all those webinars are. Yeah. I mean, and, the, and we can get that out to everybody as well. The tough thing about the census is you can get so deep on one very narrow <coughs> topic that you could spend an entire presentation on like one thing, you know. Um, and and that's that's part of the challenge. And it takes you know a long time. Like being new to going through the census can be a little daunting and, and frustrating because there's so much in there, and figuring out exactly what you need can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, so with that, let me move on from some of this stuff. Um, any other questions on this? Yeah. For stories that do require those larger CSV downloads, what mm -hmm. kind of program do you recommend? Um, depend. I mean, are you pretty proficient in Excel? I'm proficient in Excel, but I, I don't know anything beyond that. So how would you? I'm, from Excel, I would probably go to Access, Microsoft Access. Um, from Access, um, probably that will teach you structured query language. Um, so go to SQL, which is a really powerful server uh, query tool. Um, SPSS is a really great tool, but it's expensive. If you want the free stuff, R is a programmatical uh, statistical analysis tool. Um, you can also use Tableau to do pretty significant data analysis. Um, it's traditionally thought of as more of a visualization tool, uh, but you can do some pretty high-end um, analysis with Tableau, actually. And, and actually, Excel, um, they've upgraded it over the years, and it can handle several million rows. Yeah. And if you're getting beyond that, you know, like, you will want to jump up to another program, because Excel will kind of choke on, once you get up to that upper echelon of, of rows, it'll, it'll chug out a little bit. Um, let's see, where did I get to? So we did that. Um, Show the download. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some stories that we've done uh, in which we've used census data. Um, and this story, we took a look at uh, what are called risk management plan facilities. Anybody familiar with those? Um, risk management plan facilities are facilities in any given state that store large amounts of toxic chemicals. And if their chemicals exceed a, th a certain threshold, they're required to report to Department of Homeland Security and the federal government saying, hey, I have 10,000 pounds of anhydrous ammonia I in this one container. And if we were to have an accidental release, it could impact X number of people. And any facilities that exceed that threshold on uh, uh, various different chemical uh, combinations, including like water treatment plants, are always on a risk management plan. 
they're required to file that risk management plan uh, with Department of Homeland Security. And that risk management plan basically says we have X number of containers that have X chemicals, and if an accidental release happens, this is the population that it would impact. Um, the tough thing is they don't make those easily available. And one person can only review 10 of those risk management plans per month. Uh, in Arizona, we have 178 of those. So we worked with uh, ABC 15, a local TV <coughs> affiliate here, and we got 18 people together to go down to the US Marshal's office, <laughs> and each of us submitted our 10 requests. Um, but the challenge is they don't let you take a phone, they don't let you take a scanner, and they don't let you take the records with you. So what we had to do was handwrite every risk management plan out. Um, what we did was we hand wrote the first four types. There's uh, four different sections in each plan. Created a template, printed them off, and then handed them to each reporter. Went in and filled it out. Um, so basically what we did with that is, um, I'll show you kind of the general how we did this story. Um, did they use Homeland Security reasons for that? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the states, you know, the, this started with, anybody from Texas here? Well, yes? I covered the West Texas yes. blast. So that was kind of precipitated the reporting. We wanted to know how much ammonium nitrate was produced in the state of Arizona. Could a similar disaster happen here? Um, finding how many places actually produce ammonium nitrate and store it is really, really difficult. And it's up to the State Emergency Response Commission to determine whether or not they want to release it. They said, well, yeah, you can get any plan that you want from any facility, uh, but we're not going to give you a list of the facilities. Um, and we're not going to fulfill a request that just says we want all those facilities. So you have to find them, do your own research. It's, it's a kind of a long process. But so this led us to the risk management plans. Um, and what we decided to do is we wanted to map out all of the risk management plan facilities in the state of Arizona and calculate their potential blast zones from their worst case scenario incident, which is required on their risk management plan. Um, and as you can see here, there's quite a few in downtown Phoenix. Um, and we wanted to know, OK, we have these risk management plans. We have these diameters. We have these shape files that are go over the state. We want to know how many people live within one or more of those blast zones. So that's when the US Census came into play. And so what we did is we, we layered our findings. We did a, a layer of census data. Then we did a layer of our risk management plan shape files. And we calculated. The, the state's population that lives within at least one of those blast zones. So that's, yeah? What did you use to do the layering? Uh, we did uh, ArcMap. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but the map is actually built in uh, Google uh, Fusion Tables. Fusion tables. And is that where this disaggregation, the aggregation came in? Not exactly. No. So th this now, we're talking now a little bit about some GIS trickery. Um, and um, I guess there's, there's a couple different ways to skin a cat with GIS stuff, but um, the way you, you could do it here is you would ask a GIS, a piece of GIS software to draw a radius, right? So we've got the blast radius for this point, um, and then run a uh, join by location to take the layer of census data, and you have the GIS basically uh, tell you um, these are all the areas that where there's an overlap between your your radius that you've drawn around a point and all of these um, census blocks or block groups or tracks and then and then now you've got you the ability to take all those and summarize those and, and analyze that. So were you breaking blocks or tracks? You, you were just no, no, no. We, track that was in we, the we right. had well. So like if you think about it like this, if you've got a radius. And you, let's say you've got you got this block, right? That's definitely going to get counted. Right. Uh, if you've got this block, um, typically you're going to have your GIS software also count that one. So what you might end up with is you know some geometry that actually looks like this, but you've got some really good approximations. It's not close it's not work. yeah close enough for government work, okay. right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're it's, not going to be able to get any better than that. It's right. That's the answer. But so so we're showing this example because this is a really cool story that shows the risks that these facilities can pose. Um, now it required a lot of public records wrangling um, and you know database stuff and I'll show you some of what we had to do to get this but ultimately what we want to know is you know so what's the so what of this? What's the so what of why all these facilities are here? Well it's because they're schools and hospitals and people that live within those blast zones. And, and something else to I think to point out is that what you can do with census is that you, you not only have just counts for each of these, 
but you've got pretty deep demographic data, right? So you can ask the question, what's the correlation between multiple blast zone you know, coverage and median income, right? right? So are, is, it a, is it the case that lower income people happen to be covered by nine blast zones and higher income people are covered by one or none? And the answer is yes. And if you look, this is the I-10 corridor. South of the I-10 corridor, obviously it's some kind of industrial zone. Well, what's usually around industrial zones? Lower income neighborhoods, have higher minority communities. And you can see that time and time again across the state. Uh, and you can look at who would be most impacted would one of these facilities go, basically. Um, and, okay, well, I won't show you those. Um, it's just the, the, the databases that we built based on the risk management plans. Um, but it's a way to kind of further the reporting beyond the initial records requests that you get and say, how can I add more context um, and relevance to the type of reporting that we're doing? Um, and here's kind of a, a basic breakdown of, of how we use 2010 census population data, uh, used it into ArcMap, which is ArcGIS. It's a, a, a mapping software. Um, did a sum population, we got the total population. Um, so section two are the larger blast zones, usually gaseous, 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 I don't know how to say it. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so you had the total population within at least one of those blast zones and the total population, it's about 44% of our state. So 44% of our state's population lives within at least one blast zone. Um, that's a pretty alarming, you know, figure. Um, and you know, DHS probably doesn't want everybody to know this, and there's certain information that we did not include when we published the series because. Can you um, talk more about that? Because I'm, of course, me the, the other side of this is going. Well, now the terrorists know where to attack. Right. Um, right. So what? There, what, was your, what were your conversations with Homeland Security? Um, it was not so much with Homeland Security as w within our own newsroom, and we said, you know, what's the responsible thing for us to publish? Um, just because it's available doesn't mean that it would be responsible of us necessarily to publish. Um, you know, some of these facilities have, like this is just one facility um, that if one of those tanks exploded, sometimes these facilities have 10 tanks, but they're only required to list one tank that exceeds that certain threshold. Mm -hmm. So we didn't list how many tanks were at that facility. Uh, we did some in the story. We highlighted a couple facilities. Um, we didn't talk about security measures. That's listed in the risk management plans, um, security, that kind of stuff. We just did the basics. So is there a school? Yes. Residence? Yes. Basically everything because it's a 14 mile hazard zone and it would impact almost 2 million people if this one uh, facility kind of blew. The, the large circle, is that from a single yes. source or is that... A single source. Was it, is that Caliburri? Uh no. no. That's, um, this is Hill Brothers Chemical Company and it is um, chlorine. Mm -hmm. Chlorine. Chlorine. Oh, chlorine. Mm -hmm. So they, they could cover the entire uh, Yeah, so if, if that one blows up, hold your breath. Yeah. Did you determine if FEMA or any other first responder organization had already done the same analysis that you've done as part of their planning, and did you compare your data with some maybe data like this that already exists? We found out that most of the first responders within those blast zones didn't even know some of these facilities existed, um, which by law they're supposed to have their risk management plan on file. Um, and that was part of the reason, part of the the impact of the series that we had is one of the ammonium nitrate <laughs> facilities, which was twice the size of the one in West Texas, um, all the first responders surrounding that community had, didn't even know, hadn't communicated, hadn't trained with that facility whatsoever, which was a big problem why the first responders were killed in, in West Texas. The first responders are supposed to have those management plans on file? Yeah, or, or, or easy, act exactly. You can't request them from then? No, no. Um, all right, so let me uh, move on a little bit. Can you talk at some point just how long and how many people worked on a project like this? Um, to gather the data, there was 18 of us. Okay. And that was to fill in the, the risk management plans. And then myself and two other reporters did the... the and how long did it take? Uh, three months, maybe. Three months, yeah. So three reporters working full-time, 18... Just not, not, we were each working on other projects. Toward the end of the game, you know, it was maybe two, three weeks of full-time work. Um, they did the broadcast side, I did the kind of print based side, uh, and then we, I helped them, you know, look through their script to make sure it was, we weren't going to get sued by anybody, um, you know. Well, do you have, I mean, that's another great question, because often the excuse in my newsroom is we don't have 
the manpower A to do the lead work, B the legal power to vet it or and or defend it. Yeah. So I mean we're unique, you know, we're a, a small nonprofit newsroom. If the story takes us a year, it takes us a year. Um, we have lawyers that do pro bono work for us and you know we're lucky in that sense. We don't have the budget of a lot of other places, but um, but we, we'll, we'll take the time to do it. I mean, that's, that's kind of our value proposition is we'll do stories like this that other newsrooms might not have the time or resources to do. Can you talk a little bit about the response you saw from it? For those of us in, in for-profit newsrooms, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> trying to be for-profit newsrooms. Sure. Uh, you know, more and more there's pressure to, you know, if we're going to pitch a story like this, it takes a lot of time and resources to you know, know ahead of time that it's something that's going to get a big audience or a big impact, and ideally both. What, what kind of response did you see? Uh, from from the community or from you know readership uh, impact changes and you know. well we we won a regional Emmy for this one which was really cool and and it got picked up by a bunch we release our content to other newsrooms to use um, and it got picked up all over the state uh, a lot of people are like wow I didn't realize I lived within you know 16 blast zones living in downtown Phoenix um, so the response was really great and as soon as we knew that we had the 44 percent of the state and we were able to map it we knew that we had a really good story. Uh, and then it just kind of went down the rabbit hole of finding out do first responders know about this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but do your legwork before you ever pitch it. You know, like have a, have a nice proposal and maybe a little bit of mapping, if if you can, show your editors that helps. How did you guys publish it? Like you said, there was a print version and the broadcast. Mm -hmm. but was it in series or how did you? It was a series. We ended up doing about five stories with okay. the series, yeah. and it was over a period of several weeks that we released them. Yeah, and one of them was kind of at the year anniversary of the the West Texas blast. And that was the first one on ammonium nitrate. Mm -hmm. Did you have them all written before the first one ran? No. 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 They were. Yeah. yeah. I wish, but it, it, time was an issue, <laughs> sadly. Um, but let's, let's move on, get back to census a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, can they move the blast site somewhere else where they're not affecting So it's just, it is what it is, but here, you know, you know about it. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's, and, and, and risk management plan facilities are in every single state. And if you go to rtknet, dot, or rtknet, I think it is, um, you can find out all the RMP facilities in your state. Uh, and they actually have some of the risk management plans on their website, but they don't have the worst case scenario, which is how we got the, the radii of, of the different blast zones. Right to know network? Yes, right to know network, exactly. But it's, it's, I would say it's an easy story. It's not. Um, it, it takes a bit of time, but it's a good story that's relevant pretty much anywhere. Um, okay, so I know this is uh, Reynolds Center week, but um, politics is kind of my jam. Uh, <laughs> I spent several years uh, working at a political newspaper and um, got to cover redistricting in 2010, which was like just eye-opening and awesome and super nerdy. If you guys ever get an opportunity, which will be in 2021, again, um, if, you, if that, that beat is up for grabs, I recommend it, um, if that's also your jam. Um, and so, you know, they redraw all, all the lines, and when they do that, um, the redistricting process usually, I mean, it's different from state to state, but um, they typically take that 10-year decennial census data, and they, they pull it all in, and they do all the, all the, like, complicated GIS work to connect all the census data to the voting precincts um, so that you can at least in that first couple of years after a redistricting you can do all of the demographic analysis as it relates to election results. Um, if you want to do it after that then you have to kind of learn how to work with GIS software and take the new demographic data that comes out and put that into the new voting precincts because um, voter, voter precincts can change all the time. but. Um, point being, you can do some really cool election uh, analysis. Uh, let's take a look here. And this is a series that um, Evan was working at the Arizona Capital Times. Um, I was with AZCIR and we collaborated on doing a full breakdown on how the state voted in the election um, and did a lot of mapping and, um, you know, this kind of stuff. It was really cool. Yeah. and. Um, You know, here we've got places where um, the voter registration is um, somewhat competitive in some of these areas that are outlined in white, and 
then we've got um, kind of voter you know election results mapped out by red and blue uh, for this story. Uh, we did a whole series on this stuff, um, and one one of the really cool stories I'll just jump in real quick is through some. Uh, the data that we found, we found one voting precinct here that was a huge outlier in, in how that, that community voted. Um, and it was a small community up in Colorado City, which is the home to the Fundamentalist, um, fun, uh, Fundamentalist Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I think, FLDS, you know, Warren Jeffs, the kind of multiple wives guy. Um, and, you know, you can use that kind of census data to take a look at how that voting precinct voted, and then you say, what's, what's the breakdown in that community? We found out, what was it, like 98% of those who cast a ballot in that district voted identical or nearly identical, which is incredibly uncommon. Uh, and so you can take a look at the, the, the kind of, um, what is that community like? Well, it's, it's mostly fundamentalist Mormon families um, that all voted nearly identical. Can you show us how you did that? Um, <laughs> you used GIS to do that? It was um, a number of things. It was some a little more like regression uh, go-to projects. So let's see. And then come the second the one down. Vote? Sorry? <laughs> do they let the wives vote? Of course they do. They tell them how to vote, and then they let them go right. vote. Um, actually, the newer one is not going to be here, right? <laughs> the, oh, no, it would be in the, if you go to the blog or the scroll down, it should be. Um, there it is. Um, so this one actually did not take much GIS work. Um, and actually, this is more of a straight up kind of um, election results analysis. But what you can see here is, um, so this, this charts um, voter participation by different elections, the actual election itself, um, by precinct. So each line here represents a precinct. And if you look at the blue lines, we're looking at an entire county. You can see that the drop-off rate is pretty consistent, and it follows this kind of pattern where you see things kind of drop down in here. But this yellow line represents um, Colorado City's voting precinct, and it's like way outside the norm on some of these specific elections. And then when you dig in, you see um, you can you can kind of come up with with an understanding for why that is. Um, and if you guys want to talk more about that, come find me afterwards because there's a lot to it. But um, you can see this is uh, uh, voter unanimity. Um, so kind of um, really outside the norm stuff. Um, but that was just kind of some really interesting election analysis. Um, I want to talk about another project where we're doing a lot of kind of census heavy stuff. Um, we're kind of still in the thick of this one. I'm um, still working on it, uh, but I think it's fine to go ahead and preview what we're working on. We're basically looking at um, demographic analysis uh, for every single school in the state. Um, and so when you, like, at first that sounds like, oh, okay, that's cool, because, like, you can go get uh, breakdowns by school, uh, you know, what the ethnicities are and uh, what, the, what the portions are in each school. However, um, you know, you're going to naturally run into ethnicities being different in different parts of the city, different parts of the state, different counties. So what we did was we came up with a way to um, take the schools and compare them to the areas that they're in. And so we, um, so this is where the census data came in, right? So we take these schools that we know what the ethnicity breakdown is for each school. Um, there's like 1,900 schools in Arizona. Um, and then you get, you've got an address, right? So you can plot the address. And then you, this comes back to more GIS kind of trickery, but you take that address and you ask your GIS software to tell you what census tract is that, is that plot in, right? So then you've got a match between a school and a census tract. And then you can start to compare what are the ethnicities in the school, and what are the ethnicities in that tract, and what's the difference. And you can run this for now 1,900 different schools. And um, you know, 
Arizona, are school district boundaries contiguous with track boundaries, or are there differences? Uh, there are differences. And in fact, Arizona is uh, an open enrollment state, mm -hmm. so you don't you can just decide to send your kid. You ship them to town. Yeah, if you want. Um, and then specifically, what we we're looking at is uh, differences in the differences between the school and the area between charters and traditional district schools. And um, so we found some interesting stuff, and we're still working on that project now. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool. OK, so. Quick question. Yeah. So hypothetically, could you use this to say, like, let's say there's the best school in the state, like Central High School, um, but it's in an all black neighborhood. Could you use that to figure out if all the, like 90% of the kids are white and kind of figure out where they're coming from? That kind of thing? You can't figure out where they're coming from. Um, but you would be able to answer the first part of your question there. Yeah. Unless you're in a place where there, there is not open enrollment. Um, if you live in a place where if you live in that district and you have to go to that, that district school, then you could have a better understanding of, if it's a charter, for example, then people can come from anywhere. So it, it depends on how your state is set up, how the education system is. Um, but, but there's some really cool stuff you can do with enrollment numbers and then school age population, which is defined by, it's ACS that does school age pop, right? Or, Census takes a little wrangling to get. Uh, no, we, we used actual decennial we, census we data okay. to calculate school age population. That was one of the other tricks we had to figure out was uh, we couldn't just use population because you know the school age population has a different demographic than the general population. Uh, so we had to figure out how to isolate just those. And so the way you do that is you basically go and you get the um, decennial uh, data set that um, has ages and it's also sex and age and then you exclude everything above whatever you're looking at right so what we did is we went back to the 2010 decennial census and we took um, ages 0 to 14 because we're looking at 2014 data so you shift that four years and that's basically a, a good enough snapshot <laughs> of uh, your kind of age five to age 17, 18 um, demographic. So just for a story ideas, what are you trying to figure out with the data? Um, we're trying to, um, I mean, what we <laughs> what we found is yeah. that um, is that basically charter schools, for whatever reason, serve um, they over there's an overrepresentation of whites in charter schools. And so we're exploring this, this idea. And, and there's a really, really great overrepresentation of Asians in charter schools. Um, the charter schools get the same amount of state money as a public school does per student? Not exactly. Okay. Slightly off, yeah. Yeah. But um, so we're, we're exploring that, that, and we're getting pretty close to finishing up this it's, project. It's a, it's a way to look. I'm, I hate to say the word resegregation of, of schools through what's happening. And there's not a clear enough, like, there's not, the, the data isn't like, holy cow, this is really happening. It's there. There's a trend, and, and it's increasing. Um, but, you know, it's a way to look. What, what is happening in the education? Like, if you compare charters and districts and open enrollment, um, how are, are the populations shifting? And, and the general trend is, yes, they are. And there's some outliers that are like, whoa, you know, the school will have 80% Hispanic population, but the surrounding community will have, like, 10%. Um, you know, there, there's this, those discrepancies, and, and it's pretty disparate depending on where you are in the state, too. Uh, but it's a really interesting, deep kind of data look um, with using census data, enrollment data, um, and you know you can even get into the free and reduced lunches and, and all that that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because one thing I've been looking at in uh, the San Francisco area are private school enrollment. Are uh -huh. there any national databases on private school enrollment? Um, I'm, I'm pretty. Uh, I know I can talk about Arizona, and the answer is no. Um, Private schools are simply not, they don't fall into the same requirements that public schools, and you know, charters are public schools. Right. Um, they're just a different kind of public school, but they all, all of them, charters and district, traditional district schools, um, have to do certain kinds of reporting. Private schools are a whole other story. But I'd look at NCES, National Center for Education Statistics, they have some pretty good data in there. I don't know that they have private stuff though. Um, okay, so. Some stuff to take away um, with you guys. Um, if you go grab, you know, and we'll make available this um, presentation. 
you go click in on, on these links. Um, there's some really useful stuff. You can sign up with the Census Bureau to get um, emails. Um, and they have a whole menu. You can say, I want this information and this information only. Or you can sign up for the whole thing. And if you do, then you'll get like five emails a day. Um, so you may not, may not want to go, may, or maybe try it. Go sign up for all of them, and then you can sign back in later after a month and say, I only like these five uh, emails. But they'll send you, um, you know, stuff that's coming out, uh, new analysis that they're producing. Uh, there's also an embargoed um, census release sign up, so you can get uh, data uh, sometimes uh, three, four, five days, maybe a week ahead of when they release the stuff publicly. That way you can get a jump start on a story. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, again, just you know, uh, grab this presentation um, and use these links to, to get that stuff. Uh, OK. Um, so census.gov. Um, I like to bash on census.gov because it's a government website. And um, after looking at it for several years, I've come to the conclusion that they have people there that come up with new ideas for ways to present their data, and they let them do it. And then they slowly kind of like age and become useless and die. And so what that means is then, um, so you have stuff that like right now is like good to use or like has a longer shelf life, whereas this other version of the of digging into their data is not so useful. But so here's links to several different ways to get at census data. Um, uh, the American Fact Finder is probably the most robust and useful um, way to get into the census data. If you click on this link, it'll bring you to the American Fact Finder. Um, I usually just click here and go straight to the advanced search. And then I tell it to show me all. And here is kind of like your, your really useful dashboard, right? So, um, you know, we talked about geographies. You can kind of pick, you don't have to go in any order. So I'll just go ahead and pick geographies first. So you click on geographies. Um, and you can look at most requested geography types or all geography types. Um, that's important to know. Uh, but if you want to have it broken out by block groups, you would select that. If you want it by tracks, you would select that. If you want, um, Uh, metropolitan statistical areas. Uh, that's going to be like, you know, for here, I think one of the metropolitan statistic areas is Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Mesa. Or maybe it's Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Tempe. But it's like three municipalities. Um, so you'd select, so I'll just go ahead and let me just do s county. I'll just do county for now. And then it'll ask you if you want to do. Um, a state, or you can just select all counties within the United States. Uh, what's a state that somebody's interested in? Georgia. Georgia. Does this capture people in prison? <sighs> yeah. Here's why. Because we, we say, I don't know if somebody wrote an article about it, but there's this one zip code, 30310, I think, that has the most number of prison inmates are tied to this zip code. I've always wondered. Okay. There's a really good answer to that question, and I don't have it right <laughs> away. Um, I, I've done a little bit of digging into that, and I'm not sure. I, I can't recall how exactly they decide where to, where to assign prisoners. Because the Department of Corrections has never really given that up. So, mm. I mean, for 10 years, I've always wondered, how did some journalists hmm. figure that out? Let me see if I can figure that out, and if I do, I'll tweet it. It'd be a great, it I mean, it could be a great they, story. I'm probably yeah. It says too. that they count prison inmates in the prisons where they are currently serving time. Okay. So okay. That's, that makes this even a deeper mystery. Um, so I'm going to go add, I'm going to add all counties within Georgia. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're okay. Um, okay, so now it's, it's over here. You can see my selections. It's got all counties within Georgia. And we've got all these um, census data sets. And so now I want to, let's say, narrow by topic. This is usually the way I do it. Um, when you 
go and use this, you might find a different way to approach each data set, but I like to just kind of use geography and then topics. Um, I find that to be a pretty useful way to get at this stuff. So let's say we're interested in housing and um, occupancy characteristics. So you just kind of drill down and let's see owner slash renter tenure in occupied units. So this is going to be um, you know, data that relates to whether people are owning or renting. Um, let's see here. So uh, I'm just going to go tenure. And if you look over on the right, you see um, the data set that it's actually looking to. And so this is looking at 2014 ACS five-year estimates. So remember we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, the five-year is going to be the most accurate, the smallest margin of error for ACS data, American Community Survey data. Um, and, and then obviously the most recent that, they've rele that they're now releasing is 2014. So I'll click on this. And now um, we've got uh, a table here that extends real far out, but we've got each county and we've got an estimate of the number of the total number of households and then the number broken down by owner occupied and renter occupied. And then you've got a margin of error here as well. So now let's say I like I like this data set, I want to download it. Um, so you just click on the download. Um, usually the presets that come preloaded are good to go. You hit OK. It's going to get you your download ready. And now you've got a zip file that contains, let's go ahead and open it up. Uh, where'd that go? So now you've got a zip file with some CSVs and a readme text. Uh, so this kind of describes what you're looking at. And you can take that and do some analysis. Real basic stuff like, where is the highest portion of renter occupied? You know, which county in Georgia has the highest portion of renter occupied? Um, Households, things like that. Uh, how do I get to? Click back on the, yeah, there you go. Um, you can create a map. Uh, click on data value. So let's click on this to show map. Oh, government websites. Loading. You do have 159 counties. I know. I'm sorry all, about that. You picked all counties as 159 data sets. Ah, that shouldn't be so much. That's nothing. <laughs> Come on. 159. I can count to 159 by the time this thing's done. Okay. We're, we're lucky here. We only have 15. Well, Next lucky and unlucky. Here. Depends. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's American Fact Finder. Uh, that's the one that I find the most useful when I actually want to go to the Census Bureau and get data. Um, but just real quickly, I'll show you that there's some other things that have been created. Um, this is quick facts. Um, I'll just skip over that because you guys can uh, check it out on your own. Uh, then there's Census Explorer. If you were to ask somebody from the Census Bureau, to, if you ask them why, where they came up with these names and what they mean, they might not even be able to answer those questions. Um, they're all just different ways to slice census data. Again, American Fact Finder, I find to be the most useful of those tools. Um, and that brings me to uh, something I'm really excited to tell people about, and I'm kind of like an evangelist. Uh, um, maybe that I, I am an evangelist because I was involved uh, just a little tiny bit in the, peop the group that put this together. Um, they went out and found reporters that were uh, working with census data already, and they asked them, how can, we, how can we take census data in like a wholesale manner and like put it all together in one place that's a whole lot easier to interface with than what the Census Bureau does, right? Um, so for, you know, for people who want something easier, um, this is a really awesome website. So I'm gonna, let me just show you what it looks like first when you just go there. 
It's a lot more user friendly than, than not knowing much about the data and trying to navigate their kind of maze of, of different data sets and record layouts and all and kind of. Yeah. yeah. What you might most immediately recognize is like how simple this looks, right, compared to the Census Bureau. <laughs> okay? So right away you can just see that they've got a profile section at the top. You can just type something in there. Um, they've got an explore tool uh, where you can drill down into things and they've got just topic breakouts in case you are just really looking for something broad and want to start exploring. So let me show you uh, real quick what some of these different things look like. Here's a place profile um, and I could have gotten there just by typing, let me just do it this way so you guys see how easy this is. Phoenix. Hey, it brings up Phoenix. It's right there. I just got to click on it. Bingo. Now I've got like the vital statistics out of the Census Bureau for the city of Phoenix. So at the top you've got things like population, square miles, people per square mile. Um, you go down, you've got demographic breakdowns, um, population by age category. And is it giving you metro area or city limits? Um, so this is, this is the city. Yeah, this is the city of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted, we could click on Paradise Valley or Scottsdale or Tempe or any of the number of um, municipalities around here. Uh, that's yeah, go ahead. I've seen it pretty frequently. <coughs> pretty frequently. It, 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 it looks like they are still using ACS 2013 one-year data. Um, you know, they made a choice about that. Um, they could be using the 2014, but it might not allow the one-year data. They might have to use like the five-year. So they, they kind of made a decision about that. But um, it, you can get to what the margins of error are. One thing I want to point out, though, which is super cool, is any, any of these charts that you see here, you can just click on the show data, and it immediately brings it up. And then you can just click on view table and it brings you right to the table and then you can just download it right there as a CSV. Um, so how much easier is that than censusbureau.gov? Um, also, if you're interested in this chart right here and you want to throw it into a store you're working on, bingo, embed code, right? How nice is that? You can tell it you want it left aligned, right aligned, normal, and you can learn more about census reporters embed charts. Um, but it's great. I, I've used these before. They're like super quick and easy. If you're working on a story and you want to just throw what the fertility rate for um, a county is and you want to chart, you can do it like in less than a minute. Um, so let me show you guys uh, another uh, cool little thing here. So this is like, let me show you like how I would have gotten here. Um, B15003, educational attainment. So if I'm looking at Census Reporter, the, the first, the, the, their only homepage, um, and I just start typing educational attainment, it starts, it auto populates some suggestions here. Um, there's a bunch of different options. Let me find the one I was looking at there. 15. 003. This is just straight up educational attainment. So I click on that. Now I've got a topic. Now I've got a place. So let's talk about a place. Boston? Sure. Okay. Um, Boston. Cambridge, Or so I could I could click on Boston and it'll immediately bring me to that data. Um, one of the other things I could do is let's say I wanted to see like uh, neighborhoods. I just start typing tract and now it's going to give me census tracts in uh, now census tracts in Boston. Now I've got the educational attainment for each census tract. Alright, so check this out. So I'm looking at a table, right? It's a bunch of numbers, whatever. Click on map. Now we've got a cool map already made. You can hover over. You can see what you're looking at there. Um, we're looking at the column no schooling completed. Let's say I was interested in finding out how many people 
get a bachelor's degree. Now you can you can see what um, what this looks like visually, and I'm, and for somebody who's from Boston, you probably look at this and you say, oh, that makes sense, right? Uh, I'm not from there. I'm oh, there, so. oh okay. I'm, I'm from Boston. Okay, so you look at this and you think, yeah, a lot yeah, of people okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all over here. And they're all probably where the colleges are. Right. So that might be another question, like prisons. When you're in college, are you counted at a school that you're at? Mm. Because that's, I mean, oh. Boston's, it's all colleges, right? You're so, Do you know? So you're supposed to be counted at the place where you live most of the year. So most college students should be counted when they're at school, but there's a lot of controversy about it, and some end up being counted in both places. Sometimes their parents want them to be counted at home because it's like keeping the family together. <laughs> so <laughs> I know it's weird, there's like these strange dynamics, but so they're supposed to be counted where they're at school, but it doesn't always happen. Um, so that's great. Yeah. And then, um, so something else that's really cool that Census Reporter has built in is not only can you just download the data, like as a CSV, but if you want to present a map yourself, you can do things like download a KML file, which is, that stands for Keyhole Markup Language, which you don't need to know, but what's important is that that is Google's mapping language. So, so you can import this to Google Maps or Google Fusion Tables, which is um, a whole other thing, but it does mapping as well. And then you can take that and immediately go put it onto your website, right? You can embed that right into your website and you can do custom shading or whatever you really want to do in Google Maps or Google Fusion Tables. And we would just be attributing this to the census. Yeah, because this is all census data. Yeah. Um, you can also get a shape file in case you want to drag this into um, something like ArcGIS or QGIS, which is like a more robust GIS software. Uh, and then one other cool way to look at the data is, um, OK, this doesn't make as, okay, this is, it'll still, hopefully it'll make sense. All right, so this is, I, I forget what they call these charts. I think they, this is the only place I've ever seen these done, but um, I think they're calling them COAL, like C-O-A-L charts, and they, and I've begged them to give me embeds on these, uh, so we'll see if they ever get that done, but basically you can highlight specific geographies and see where they fall on a distribution um, so if you were interested in seeing, get rid of that, uh, doctorate degrees. Um, so there's this one tract that has, okay, maybe, <laughs> uh, plus or minus six. All right, so margin of error issues there. Uh, let's look at just bachelor's degrees. So we've got this one here um, where they estimate 55% of everybody living in this census tract has a bachelor's degree, and they estimate that 0% have an associate's degree. All right, that's interesting. Um, but these are cool charts. I like them. Uh, play around with it. Um, and let's take a, a couple things while he's clicking around. You'll, you'll notice these, these code designations like B05, zero zero, you know, whatever those are. Those correlate, those match up to the census individual tables that they have on different data breakdowns. Yeah, so, every, yeah, yeah, every single census data set has a code like that. So B15003 is educational attainment. And so if you, if you want a quick look, say I'm interested in exploring this data set, and go to Census Reporter, check it out, and it has a really nice, simple, easy to understand, really quick looking at kind of interviewing the data of what it says, uh, and you get a really nice, quick look at what that says. And then drilling down a little further, if you want this over time, for example, then maybe jump into census.gov and download that B05 whatever uh, for over 10 years. Right. Um, and, and so this is like a great intro way to say, I'm interested in exploring this. Um, and then you can see it in a really easy to use, easy to visualize and understand way. And Frank, you can download it from here too, which is great. But if you're looking at doing more complex um, or multiple data sets, you know, comparing things over time, uh, then you probably want to go get the raw data itself. Um, and, yeah. and you can get that from, yeah. And so like I clicked on, from the topics section here, I clicked on health insurance. So mm -hmm. now it brings up 
all these different data sets that are related to health insurance and let's say I'm like doing something about uh, military health care and I'm really interested in TRICARE, right? That's the military's uh, insurance. Um, I see that there's a data set B27008. I can click in on here and now I'm looking at this and I can start to explore places and geographies and things like that. But I also know that the B27008 code, if I want to find what this looked like from uh, you know, the 2013 ACS or whatever this is pulling from, I think that's what this is, it should say on here somewhere. No, no it doesn't, okay. I think it's pulling from the uh, 2013 ACS, but if I wanted to take this and do, again, an overtime comparison to see what it looked like uh, five years before that, I can take this, go back to the census bureau.gov, plug in, I can just copy this, um, and I can go to American Fact Finder, and I can just delete these, and TRICARE military coverage by sex by age. And I can click go, and now you see I've got 2014 ACS, 2013 ACS, 2012 ACS, going back to 2010 ACS. So, like Brandon was saying, it's a, it's a great way if you, if you want to start exploring something and maybe even start visualizing it or, or doing, pulling stuff into your reporting, it's, it's great. And then if you want to go real deep and do some overtime stuff, you can just jump right back into the clunky, horrible census.gov website and plug in your, your code. Um, okay, so we're getting north toward the end and we're doing pretty good on time. Seem to have paced it pretty well, so that's good. Um, uh, so some advanced tricks. Um, we talked about geospatial joins a little bit, like when we were talking about this stuff. And this is kind of maybe the way you would look at <coughs> correlating any um, kind of information with your, with your census data. Um, so if you've got blast zones and um, you, you know, start to learn a GIS, a piece of GIS software, and you do a geospatial join, and you uh, do some summary, right? So just, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this real quick, like how you get through this stuff, but let's say you ended up with a count for the number of blast zones for every single um, census tract or, or census block, you know, then you can start to think about that in terms of, you know, from let's say it's zero to 10, um, and you, you plot out all the census tracts along this x-axis and then over here because you're dealing with census tracts you can plug in whatever other variable you're thinking about so if that's median household income or educational attainment or poverty status uh, you know you plug in that on your y-axis and then you start to have scatter plots and hopefully they make sense and if you find that there's a, a correlation, then you've got a story that you can go work on right away. Um, and that's breezing through some kind of heavy stuff, but that makes sense. Any questions about that? How you at least think about that stuff? Okay. Uh, oh, and then we talked a little bit about combining data sets over, t uh, over time to find change. And um, so just to quickly end, so we have a few minutes for any questions. Um, so I've got some links in here to some like take home uh, projects that incorporate some of those uh, advanced tricks um, and it's, they walk step by step through how to do this stuff but you can do things like change in poverty um, city by city for any given state you can do change in income inequality um, at, a, at ev any level you like but what I've walked through is a track level so that you could basically look at neighborhoods. So like if you were interested in plotting what's the change in income inequality neighborhood by neighborhood within the city of Phoenix. Um, this walks through how you would pull the data down and, and do all that. And, and also map that out because that's always really useful. And then this kind of combines several different things um, to look at kind of gentrification, right? Because what is gentrification? It's basically um, property values going up while minority portions go down. I mean, that's, I mean, if you're going to really put a sharp tip on it, right? 
Um, it's white people moving back into the urban areas and typically causing property values to go up and forcing out lower socioeconomic status folks who happen to typically break along ethnic lines. So a couple, a couple other things too. When you, when you think about census data um, in your reporting, you, get, you guys probably use BLS, like Bureau of Labor Statistics, quite a bit. Um, if you're pulling a data set from BLS and you say, I wonder if, or does this population have any impact on that? Like if this then, is that happening? Um, think about your stories and your data in that way and think about how the census data can add to the context of your story or add to some deeper element beyond that kind of surface level. Oh, here's some raw numbers on unemployment. Um, you know, if I want unemployment numbers, let's, let's look at it at a, at a more detailed and finite breakdown. Um, you know, we almost, you know, a majority of the stories I think that we do, we use census data in some way um, because we're often looking at demographics and we want to know if I'm looking at blast zones, do they impact this demographic more than they impact that demographic or this region more than that region? Or if, if, you know, one industry is failing in one part of the city, is that going to relate to the unemployment rate through BLS and, and yada, yada, yada. Um, so if you think in terms of not just one data set as explaining everything, but starting to look at, I can look at the racial demographics here, the socioeconomic here, combined with this data set, you can start to get into some really complex um, analysis that you can hang an entire story on. Um, now that, that analysis might take you a week or two, uh, but that finding, might be your lead. Um, and, and it's really cool. Once you start to get familiar with how to look through census, how to look through other data sets, you can really start to see how you can add context to stories that, even a daily story. And even if you go through Census Reporter and you pull some basic numbers, all of a sudden you've added depth and context to a daily turn story that otherwise would have just been kind of surface level and generic, if that makes sense. Uh, so I think we're right at well, 1031. Uh, if anybody's itching to get out of here, I guess it's so. nice having you. But if you have any questions, right there. In terms of fact checking, do you sort of keep a separate file of your workflow? Like I ran this query and did this. How do you do that? Yeah. Uh, so Always, for that, yeah. that school demographics yeah. project yeah. that we're working on, I've got a text file that has, I want to say, like 150 different steps, right? And I've had to go back and redo the whole thing like several times. So every time I start fresh and just talk about, okay, this data set got from Census Bureau, next line. Um, took it and isolated these columns. And, and keep that because you're, you, you don't want to end up at a place where you're done with your story and then you're like, uh, how, how did I get here? This? Yeah. The, other, yeah. the very first thing you should always do, whenever you download a data set, make a copy. Never work off the original data set that you're working on. Like, so I always have an original folder where it's the original data set, and then I have a working folder, and then I have different versions of my working data set. Um, because some of the stuff that we're doing, we're doing you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 queries that we're manipulating the data. And if at the end of it, you turn in your story to your editor, and they're like, I don't believe you that 44% of the state's population lives within a blast zone. Um, you know, you can, you can track that. And actually, on that, that hazmat story, one of the things, our first query that we ran um, with the, the shape files, and it was like, oh, 65% of the state's population lives within a blast zone. I'm like, ah, that seems way too high. And what we found is that the overlapping boundaries were double counting. And so instead of having one shape file for the whole state, for each of those, we had individual laid on top of each other. And so that was kind of a gut check of 65% doesn't, doesn't sound right. That seems way too high. If it was right, we were like, sweet, that's a really good story. You know? um, but, but it was wrong. So... Uh, but always make a copy and then always kind of do a gut check. And, and I'm a huge fan, and, and we do it, track everything you do. Um, kind of call it like a data dictionary. You can, you can go back through, and anybody can come into your data set, whether it's an editor or somebody that's fact-checking, and say this is exactly how this analysis was done. Um, and you can repeat it and hopefully come to the same result at the end. I know you guys focus on Arizona, but I wonder if you ever share your templates with news organizations across the country. Mm -hmm. But then we plug in. If, if you guys are interested in the risk management plan, section two, three, four, and five, let me know. I've, I've, I've handwritten it out, and you can, you can print it out in a simple way. It would be an easy way to do that story if you want. I'm, I'm happy to share it. But we, we release most of the data sets that we do. And uh, for this education piece that, that uh, Evan did, the, you know, all the heavy lifting on the data on that, uh, we'll do a full methodology, too, with our story. 
to explain exactly how we did the analysis. So, you know, most people, most of the public generally doesn't care, but there are people that really care, how did you do this story? And how did you compare that charter school to a 10 mile radius of census tracts and other district schools comparing those demographic breakdowns? And, and yeah, and a lot of times we're dealing with data sets that are handled at a state level, so it's not gonna translate 100%, but, um, you know, there was a great education analysis, demographics analysis done in Florida recently, and like, go look at that one, and like they put their, their methodology out there. You can look through it, you can say, okay, this is really cool, would this work here? Not exactly, but now you've got some good ideas. So we try to kind of make that same methodology available so that we can at least provide like, here's the framework for how we approach this, and here's how you can try to do it, depending on what the unique situation in your state is. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, just straight up census data, then actually that's probably quite a bit easier and you can you know, make that available and people can go just replicate it like 100%. Yeah. After that story, how did you figure out that the numbers were off because of the overlapping areas with double counting? How did we know that it was how double? How did you figure it out that that was the issue? Um, just trial and error. We, we, I noticed the number was too high and, and I'm not a, like a GIS expert so we had an intern that was working with us at the time who actually works at the geography school here at ASU and uh, she, you know, we walked step by step through her methodology and we said, okay, how did you do this? What did you do next? What join did you do? How did you treat those shape files? And we realized that she treated each, each radius as its individual own shape file instead of merging them into one shape file layer, basically. I guess that's kind of an underline for how cautious you need to be yeah. as you're yeah. getting ready to, to put this out or you're getting close to the end of your, yeah. of your reporting. Could you do any of this like radius mapping and stuff uh, using Tableau, do you think? I don't know if I you haven't can, I don't know tried. If radius uh, I'm not a, I'm, you know, every, every data journalist you talk to is gonna have their, like I like this one, I don't like that one. I'm not a huge fan of Tableau myself, so I haven't tried to do it. If, if you had the shape files, I think you could import them into over as a layer on top, it, as long as the data, you have the, the table of the shape files and um, the specific sizes, I, you I, should be able to import it in. And I will take a moment to plug QGIS, which is free. It's a total ripoff of ArcGIS, which yeah. is thousands of dollars. And uh, that's what I was saying, because ArcGIS is <laughs> was no more time up and was QGIS. Uh, it stands for Quantum GIS, and it's a, it's a totally open um, ripped off version of ArcGIS and there's a great community of people out there who work on it all the time and update it. Um, it can be buggy because it's open software, um, but I've always been happy with it. And just to jump 